Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and the mercy and blessings of God be with you all. Thank you for joining me for this live post. In this post, uh, we will be looking at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. I'll read it and uh, offer my brief comments. So I begin by praising our Creator and Fashioner, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask you, God, to send peace and blessings upon all of your prophets, your messengers, uh, all of your righteous servants, all of your righteous servants uh, throughout all time. I ask you to bless all of us here today from around the globe. Uh, keep everyone safe and healthy, uh, free of COVID-19 and every other disease and sickness and distress and stress. I ask you, God, to bless us all and uh, uh, give us that guidance that you want us to embrace uh, for our eternal salvation. So, brothers, sisters, and friends, uh, today I will be looking at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. I'll look at your comments from time to time, and I'll give a shout out to whoever shares the, the um, the post and uh, in the meantime let me um, just uh, start the reading and of course I'll look at your questions and comments and try to answer them the best uh, that I can so uh, Matthew chapter 22 and now we come to the parable of the banquet so which Bible version should I ch choose today um, how about contemporary English version? Let's see how that reads. Contemporary English version, C-E-V for short. The Great Banquet. Once again, Jesus used stories to teach the people. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like what happened when a king gave a wedding banquet for his son. The king sent some servants to tell the invited guests to come to the banquet, but the guests refused. He sent other servants to say to the guests, the banquet is ready. My cattle and prize uh, calves have all been prepared. Everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests did not pay any attention. Some of them left for their farms and some went to their places of business. Others grabbed the servants and beat them up, uh, grabbed the servants, then beat them up and killed them. This made the king so furious that he sent an army to kill those murderers and burn down their city. Then he said to the servants, it is time for the wedding banquet and the invited guests don't deserve to come. Go out to the street corners and tell everyone you meet to come to the banquet. Then they went out on the streets and brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet room was filled with guests. When the king went, in to meet the guests, he found that one of them wasn't wearing the right kind of clothes for the wedding. The king asked, friend, why didn't you wear proper clothes for the wedding? But the guests had no excuse. So the king gave orders for this person to be tied hand and foot and to be thrown outside into the dark. That's where people will cry and grit their teeth in pain. Many are invited, but only a few are chosen. Now, this is uh, not an easy story for us to uh, wrap our minds around because, you know, when a parable is told like this is like that, then we expect to see, uh, you know, a correspondence that will drive home a certain point. But it's hard to uh, see what point is being driven home here. I'm going to look uh, very quickly at the commentaries that are given here on, on Bible Hub. So we have, um, let's say, Ellicott's commentary for English readers. Um, we have Benson's commentary, Matthew, Hen Ma Matthew Henry's concise commentary. Let's see what Matthew Henry has to say, since this is concise, and we'll get a gist, like how does a, um, how, how does a, uh, a Christian commentator regard this? Okay. So Matthew Henry's uh, concise commentary says, the provision made for perishing souls in the gospel uh, is represented by a royal feast made by a king with Eastern liberality, uh, liberality on the marriage of his son. Our merciful God has not only provided food, but a royal feast for the perishing souls of his rebellious creatures. There is enough to spare and everything that can add to our present comfort and everlasting happiness in the salvation of his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, the uh, guests first invited were the Jews when the prophets of the Old Testament prevailed 
when the old uh, prophets of the Old Testament prevailed not, nor John the Baptist, nor Christ himself, who told them the kingdom of God was at hand, the apostles and ministers of the gospel were sent after Christ's resurrection to tell them it was come and to persuade them to accept the offer. The reason why sinners come not to Christ and salvation by him is not uh, uh, because they cannot, but because they will not. Making light of Christ and of the great salvation brought out by him is the damning sin of the world. They were careless. Multitudes perish forever uh, through, uh, forever through mere carelessness, who show no direct aversion but are careless as to their souls. Also, the business and the profit of worldly employments hinder many in closing in, uh, in, in closing uh, uh, with the Savior. Both farmers and merchants must be diligent, but whatever we have of the world in our hands, our care must be to keep it out of our hearts, lest it come between us and Christ. Uh, the utter ruin uh, coming upon the Jewish church and nation is here represented. Persecution of Christ's faithful ministry, ministers fills up the measure of guilt of any people. The offer of Christ and salvation to the Gentiles was not expected. It was such a surprise that it would be as it would be to wearfaring men to be invited to a royal wedding feast. The design of the gospel is to gather souls to Christ, all the children of God scattered abroad, uh, according to uh, John 10 and 11. The case of hypocrites is uh, represented by the guest uh, that has not had, uh, uh, that had not on a wedding garment, wedding garment. It concerns all to prepare for the scrutiny and those and those only who put on the Lord Jesus, who have a Christian temper of mind, who live by faith in Christ, and to whom he is all in all, have the wedding garment. The imputed righteousness of Christ and the sanctification of the Spirit are both alike necessary. And no man has the wedding garment by nature uh, or can form it for himself. The day is coming when hypocrites will be called to account for all their presu uh, presumptions. Uh, for all their presumptuous intruding into gospel ordinances and usurpation of gospel privileges, take him away. Those that walk unworthy of Christianity forfeit all the happiness they presumptuously claimed. Our Savior here passes out uh, uh, of the parable into that which it teaches. Hypo hypocrites go by the light of the gospel itself down to utter darkness. Many are called to the wedding feast, that is to salvation, but few have the wedding garment, the righteousness of Christ, the sanctification of the Spirit. Then let us examine ourselves whether we are in the faith and seek to be approved by the King. Okay, interesting commentary there. So let's go back and look at the passage with that commentary in mind and see how everything now uh, makes sense or um, perhaps fails to make sense. Let's see. Um, so the king, uh, so the kingdom of heaven is like what happened when a king gave a banquet. All right, so the king gave a banquet for his son. He sent the servants to tell the invited guests to come to the banquet. The guests refused, and then he sent other servants. Uh, and then uh, those guests still didn't pay any attention. Some of them left for their farm. Some went to the places of business. Others grabbed the servants and beat them and killed them. Uh, this made the king so furious that he sent an army to those murderers to, and burned down their city. Then he said to the servants, it is time for the wedding banquet and the invited guests don't deserve to come. So go out to the street corners and tell everyone you meet to come to the banquet. They went out in the streets uh, and brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet room was filled with guests. Okay, so let's, let's pause here for a minute with the reading and, and see what has happened here. So um, Matthew Henry's commentary is saying, well, the, look, think about the Jews. The Jews uh, had prophets coming to them one after another. John the Baptist came, Jesus came, uh, giving them this invitation to come to the banquet that God has prepared for them. And um, of course, we're not talking about uh, Jewish folks today. We're talking about Jews at that time um, of Jesus is saying this parable. And then Matthew Henry's commentary is expounding upon that further by saying, okay, even after that, the apostles will go and preach to them and so on. 
Okay, so but at the time when Jesus was saying this, it looks like the deal was already done. And um, okay, so these people did not uh, rally to the call. Rather, uh, they uh, some of them would either even uh, beat up and kill the messenger who came to them. And of course, we can see a premonition of Jesus's impending uh, passion uh, in in the works here. So then, uh, the uh, king uh, sent out other people to, um, like, sent out uh, messengers to go and uh, invite Ed, all and sundry to the to the wedding. So then we might see that um, okay, so the apostles came to the Jews; they did not uh, believe. But then they go and spread the message to all and sundry. Uh, but uh, what Muslims may see here that the message uh, has come directly from God. Uh, through a messenger of God, that is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to invite, uh, let's say, the Arabs uh, of Arabia pre uh, initially, and then the rest of the world by extension uh, to, to that message. And hence, we have the birth of the religion of Islam. Now, we come to verse number 11. When the king went in to meet the guests, he found that one of them wasn't wearing the right kind of clothes for the wedding. The king asked, a friend, why didn't you wear proper clothes for the wedding? But the guest had no excuse. So the king gave orders for this person to be tied hand and foot and be thrown outside into the dark. That's where people will cry and grit their teeth in pain. Many are invited, but only a few are chosen. So... The, the king notices this man who does not have proper uh, garments for the wedding. And uh, in, in these parables, unfortunately, one of the difficulties I find uh, is, is the, the unreasonableness of the, of the king. Um, the, and, and of course, if, if God is meant to, to be the, the king represented in the story, then uh, it doesn't look good for God. It shows the king acting in an... Um, in a capricious way. So in any case, uh, so the, the story has it that the king notices this man in uh, inappropriate uh, garments. Uh, he's not really dressed for the wedding. But what shouldn't that have, that have been expected? See the man, it, it, because by this time, the king has sent his servants to invite anyone they meet on the street. So if they go and they invite anyone on the street and they say, hey, the king is throwing a banquet for you, just come and have some fun there. So people are probably going to come as they are. And if there is a beggar on the street uh, not having proper clothes for a wedding, so what do we expect? The beggar is going to be there without uh, the appropriate clothing for a wedding. Like he's not dressed for a wedding. So why would the king be angry with that person? And by extension, why would God be angry with a person who is not uh, meeting up to certain expectations? Nonetheless, let's take Mac Matthew's, uh, Matthew Henry's commentary as a guide here and say that, all right, so there are some people who are there as hypocrites. They have come in with the crowd. And they're there as if they are the wedding guests. Uh, and to Matthew Henry, this is uh, Christians who are not really living up to Christ. They have not clothed themselves with the garment of sanctification uh, that has uh, that should have been uh, the uh, result of uh, a person's uh, accepting the, and embracing the gospel. So um, Jesus will uh, be that king who will come now and identify those uh, persons from within Christian congregations who are not true Christians, and he uh, will have them uh, thrown out. Um, and so Matthew Henry is calling on people, to, uh, Christians in particular, to live up uh, to the Christian gospel. Okay, so many are invited, only a few are uh, chosen. I'll take a quick look at the comments to make sure that everything is okay, because I'm sure that if... Uh, there is any problem with the audio or video you will alert me and I do not see anything like that yet though I do see comments from Abdul Malik and Suleiman and from Ahmed Abbas I say wa alaikum salam to you all and uh, I'll come back to your detailed questions and try to answer them a little bit later meanwhile I see that uh, Mufayruz uh, Brambley uh, has shared the stream and uh, sorry uh, brother Fairuz, if I've uh, mispronounced your name, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for that and may Allah accept your good effort and thank you. I thank you for sharing the, the stream. 
Okay, so I'll go back to the reading and when I'm done with it, I'll come back to look at your questions in more detail. Okay, so you see uh, off the bat, you could uh, recognize that the contemporary English version is a, a smoother, easier read, right? You can grasp the meaning almost immediately. No, no need to like uh, stumble over it and, and ask, so at least the meaning of the, of the words and the expressions here, uh, the, the broader meaning of the parables and so on, uh, we've seen that could be a little bit more complex. But this is a simpler English rendering. And how do they achieve? Like why, why does one English rendering go so smoothly and another one a little bit more roughly? We, we've seen in, on a previous occasion that when we looked at the literal translation, the literal translation reads very rough. Why? Because they're trying to follow the original language like blow by blow, like word for word and so on. So when they do that, the translation becomes stilted. It's good for the student who is studying, let's say the Greek in this case, and they want to see how it compares to the English translation. They want to see a kind of a word for word correspondence. But uh, when we're reading and we just want to grasp the meaning, the, uh, something like the contemporary English version, which is uh, a slight paraphrase, uh, will give us the meaning in, you know, a very um, simply uh, uh, put in, in our modern and contemporary English uh, language. Even Matthew Henry's commentary I was reading has uh, a lot of old English in it, as you can tell, because the book wasn't written yesterday. Uh, so the, the English shows, uh, contemporary English version wants to give us the, the message in the language of our day. So sometimes uh, that's good for us because that's all we want. We want to quickly grasp the message. Uh, and sometimes it's not because we want to see what the original actually said. So we want to get a close wording to the original. Uh, even though we don't know the language, uh, the original language, and we just want to get it in English, but we want to know what precisely did Jesus say, for example. And so we need to sometimes look at one of those literal translations. But now, let's continue with the contemporary English version. Now we come to the section on paying taxes. So we're in Matthew chapter 22, and uh, I'll read now from verse number 15. The Pharisees got together and planned how they could trick Jesus into saying something wrong. They sent some of their followers and some of Herod's followers to say to him, uh, Teacher, uh, we know that you are honest. I want to stop there and say something about who these players are. So Pharisees. Pharisees are a group of, uh, of Jews who um, they, they wanted to, you know, to be pure. So they, they are trying to follow uh, the... Uh, scriptures, the teachings, um, to, in a very literal way, and um, you know they want to be pure, set aside from other people. The most uh, extreme version of this uh, were the Essenes, who went to live in uh, what what is now known uh, the, the area around the Dead Sea. They went to live in the Qumran caves. Uh, from which caves uh, documents were delivered were discovered known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the Pharisees, uh, though being like that to a certain extent, wanted to remain within uh, the community and not uh, so separate themselves. Uh, yet they observed a lot of purity laws and so on. Now, uh, that, that is in distinction with uh, the Sadducees, another group of Jews who will come to in verse number 23 down below. The Sadducees uh, were more aligned with uh, the Roman government. So the Sadducees will probably be the persons appointed by the Roman government, government uh, in, in certain um, official roles. Uh, now, the follower, some of Herod's followers, so these, uh, these, this is a political entity now. Um, Herod was uh, a previous king. So, um, so what is meant by Herod's followers? I don't know precisely, but let's see what the footnote here says. Um, does it say something? Yeah, Herod's followers, people who were political followers of the family of Herod the Great. Uh, see chapter 2, verse number 1, and his son Herod Antipas, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, and who wanted Herod to be king in Jerusalem. So that's a political uh, faction. All right, so these, uh, so you can see that, that there, 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 is a poli there, there is politics in, day, in Jesus' day, and, uh, you know, everybody's trying to trap him, either from a religious angle or from a political angle. So what would be the political angle? The political angle would be that if Jesus, uh, you know, says something against the government, 
had the Roman uh, rulership, then Jesus, you know, that might be a cause for Jesus to be arrested and perhaps put to death. So they come to him, they try to trap him. Um, so then the question that they're putting to him. So let me read back again from verse number 15 so we can see how the flow of ideas here are, uh, is present. Uh, the Pharisees got together and planned how they could trick Jesus into saying something wrong. They sent some of their followers and some of Herod's followers to say to him, Teacher, uh, we know that you are honest. You teach the truth about what God wants people to do. And you treat everyone with the same respect, no matter who they are. Tell us, what do you think? Should we pay taxes to the emperor or not? So you see, they, they start with, uh, people who try to trap you, they start with flowery, flowery language and so on. They try to, you know, tell you that they're on your side, you were with them and whatever, uh, you're on the same page here and then they just need something from you, all right? So they're trying to now ask him about taxes. So how should Jesus answer? Verse number 18, Jesus knew their evil thoughts and said, why are you trying to test me, you show-offs? Tell me, uh, let, let me see, let me see one of the coins used for paying taxes. They brought him a silver coin and he asked, whose picture and name are on it? The emperors, they answered, uh, well, literally Caesar. Uh, then Jesus told them, give the emperor what belongs to him and give God what belongs to God. His answer surprised them so much that they walked away. So uh, some may take this to mean that Jesus was saying, okay, just be good Christians and pay your taxes. but. As Richard Horsley has pointed out in his massive tomes uh, in which he has written about the political um, uh, aspirations and, and the um, concerns and considerations in Jesus' time, has pointed out that, you know, for, for that time among the Jews, um, when, when you say that, that this coin has the face of uh, Caesar, it doesn't mean that the coin belongs to Caesar. For Jews at the time, um, it, everything belonged to God. So Jesus, in a veiled way, was saying to the Jews, uh, no, don't pay to Caesar anything. Um, but uh, the, uh, the Romans, hearing him, would think, okay, he's telling them, just be good Christians and pay your taxes. Uh, so, so Jesus was giving, a, you know, a double entendre here, or at least leaving the matter vague so that everyone could interpret it the way they wanted and nobody could trap Jesus. Okay, so life in the future world, that's the next uh, subject heading. We're getting to the last half of the um, um, of this chapter now, and then I'll go to your questions and comments. Okay, verse number 23. The Sadducees did not believe people would rise for, to life after death. So that same day, some of the Sadducees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, Moses wrote that if a married man dies and has no children, the brother should marry the widow. Uh, their first son would then be brought, off, uh, brought uh, would then be thought of as the son of the dead brother. Once there were seven brothers who lived here. The first one married but died without having any children, so his wife was left to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brothers, and finally to all seven of them. At last, the woman died. When God raises people from the uh, from death. Whose wife will this woman be? Uh, she had been married to all seven brothers. Jesus answered, you are completely wrong. You don't know what the scriptures teach and you don't know anything about the power of God. When God raises people to life, they won't marry. They will be like the angels in heaven. And as for people being raised to life, God was speaking to you when he said, I am the God worshiped by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isn't the God, he isn't the God of the dead, but of the living. The crowds were surprised to hear what Jesus was teaching. So now, uh, think about this uh, marriage form, which is known as leverate marriage. A brother dies and they, uh, you know, leaving his wife uh, with no children, and then uh, the, uh, the his neck his brother uh, next in line takes the wife and so we have had a situation in which there was seven so um, persons so now um, so they they are saying okay uh, they don't believe in life after death so they're trying to raise a kind of complication we find this always when somebody does not believe uh, in God or something like this they are going to raise all kinds of uh, 
questions and, and problems for that belief. So they, they don't believe that people are going to raise back to life. But So now they're starting, trying to say, okay, if you, Jesus, say that people are going to raise back to life, uh, then uh, think, think about this worldly situation. So in the next life, whose wife is this woman going to be? Because she's had all seven brothers as her husband. Um, so... Uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, you don't know anything about the power of God. When he raises them, they won't ma marry. They will be like angels in heaven. Uh, so he uh, avoided the question in this, in this way. And um, uh, so Christians would have an idea that uh, there is no such uh, thing as, um, as the kinds of carnal pleasures that we know here um, in heaven. And uh, some would raise an eyebrow at the descriptions which are found in the Quran about people being with their wives and so on. And uh, more so in, in Hadith, which is uh, in which there are graphic descriptions about, you know, men having uh, intercourse with their wives in, in, in paradise. And so Christians would think that, okay, nothing like this is um, really what they envision as their idea of heaven. Nonetheless, I won't be detained uh, on that point now. Uh, so uh, the, the other point is that God is, uh, like Jesus says to them, uh, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. So when it says God of Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob, uh, he, he's not talking about dead people. He's talking about people who are still alive. Uh, so from that uh, statement that God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Jesus is deriving the idea that God is still alive. This is what we might call a kind of a botany interpretation, the kind of, you know, uh, reading into it something that isn't said. So uh, we would think typically that when the statement of the Bible reads that God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Moses, uh, and Jacob in this case, that he's the God that was worshipped. And so it is translated here in the contemporary English version. But other versions says just simply the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jesus is reading from that. If he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's not the God of dead people. He's the God of living people. And that would mean that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. So uh, to him, uh, to, to Jesus, uh, you know, this is the answer against the Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. They, but Jesus is saying, well, you know, these patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have already resurrected from the dead. You just don't know it. They're already alive. Um, the crowds were surprised to hear what Jesus was, was teaching, and that's the conclusion of that uh, section there. And then we come to the most important commandments. Now, this is something that all everyone needs to pay attention to because this is the most important commandment of all the commandments of the Bible. Uh, this one is the most important, so everybody has got to pay attention here. And we're getting to the end. We're at uh, verse number uh, 34, and there are only 45 verses in this chapter. Then I'll look at your questions and your comments in detail. So the most important commandment, verse number 34, after Jesus had made the Sadducees look foolish, the Pharisees heard about it and got together. One of them was an expert in the Jewish law. So he tried to test Jesus by asking, teacher, what is the most important commandment of the law, in the law? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, this is the first and most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like this one, and it, and it is, love others as much as you love yourself. All the law of Moses and the books and the prophets uh, and the books of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So, two commandments: love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, and love your uh, neighbor, love others as you love yourself. So. From uh, we, we might summarize this in a Muslim way by saying there is Hakullah, the right of God, and Hakullah Ibad, the, uh, the rights of God's servants on us. So everything else is uh, detail and commentary on these two most important uh, commandments. Uh, so uh, what does it mean to love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind? It means that he must be your only God. You can't have another one that you love with, your, with, with any part of your heart and soul and mind. Of course, you can love your, your, your parents, your children, your, 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 your spouse, your, 
uh, siblings and all of that. Yes, but that's a different kind of love. But, but when it comes to like somebody in the God category, there is only one. So what, what you, you know, you love your neighbor, of course, it, it, you know, while it says love your God, the God love your God, uh, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind, it's still saying love your neighbor. So there's a different kind of love. Yes. You can love others, you can love people. Uh, Muslims love the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Christians love Jesus. Uh, but uh, there is a love that is to be for the Lord, your God, and that on, he's the only one in that category that you can love. So there's a certain, um, let's say if our love, uh, the, our capacity to love is to be segmented, you know, we can love God, we can love a spouse, we can love children and so on. So, um, you know, we don't love, the children the same way we love the spouse and with the spouse there is a certain type of love that doesn't translate to the children and and so on uh, so there, there is a love that we have for god that does not translate to anyone else no one else can be loved with that love that we have for god that that's between us and god is uh, is and it's locked in like only only god deserves that love that we reserve for the love of God, there's no one else. Uh, so there cannot be a second or third person in that in that love. Uh, we, we love God and God alone. Uh, so if uh, if anyone ascribes anyone else as partner with God, to, by saying that God is, you know, um, this person is associated with God, is the second person, third person, and so on, uh, to Muslims, this is a watering down of this commandment. It's actually a contradiction of this commandment, a contravention of this commandment to love someone else with that love that is to be reserved for God alone. It is interesting that Matthew has... Um, uh, has in a way um, watered down what he has gotten from Mark because if we compare Mark chapter 12 verses 28 to 34 we will find uh, that um, the greatest commandment as it is mentioned there in Mark's gospel on the words of uh, on the lips of Jesus is that uh, you know the, the, it is about the oneness of God and then it comes to love your God with all your heart and soul and mind but Matthew has omitted that part and we can see that uh, as we go from Mark to Matthew and also Luke has done the same thing uh, we see that there is a watering down of the original teachings of Jesus which stressed monotheism is still stressed here uh, but uh, the um, you know a very important commandment there is um, is removed uh, let's let's go to mark and see that by comparison i copy here that mark and i go here and okay so Yeah, so reading here from the um, Mark chapter 12, verse 28, we want a contemporary English version. Uh, so, one of the teachers of the law of Moses came up while Jesus and the Sadducees were arguing. And when he heard Jesus give a good answer, he asked him, what is the most important commandment? Jesus answered, the most important one says, people of Israel, you have only one Lord and God, uh, you must love him with all your heart so, uh, and all your mind and all your strength. So uh, the, the, you have only one Lord and God. Um, so this is not, um, uh, th this is the passage that stresses the oneness of God uh, that has been omitted by Matthew as he copied uh, Mark's gospel. And uh, to me, that's a significant omission um, because the question of the oneness of God has become uh, now a, a point that uh, Muslims feel they need to remind our Christian friends about. Because yes, our Christian friends also affirm that there is only one God, but uh, those who are Trinitarians among our Christian friends will then add, but Jesus is also God, the Holy Spirit is God, and then, but the three is one. And then Muslims get lost uh, in that whole discussion. Like, uh, how do you mean? Uh, there uh, are three, each one is God, and yet you only have only one God. So uh, uh, to me, if Matthew has, had retained that emphasis on the oneness of God, 
and, and, and other writers of the New Testament as well, then Muslims and Christians would have been uh, on, on the same page. Anyway, I must uh, continue the reading. I'm getting to the end now, just a few verses remaining, just five verses. And these five verses deal with the question about David's son. So, um, and then I look at your questions and comments and try to answer your questions. Verse number 41, while the Pharisees were still there, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose family will he be from? They answered, he will be a son of King David. Jesus replied, how then could the spirit lead David to call the Messiah his Lord? David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for you. If David called the Messiah his Lord, how can the Messiah be a son of King David? No one was able to give Jesus an answer. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any more questions. So uh, Jesus now is putting the question back to him, uh, to them. They were questioning him. Now he's putting a question back to, uh, to them. Uh, and he's asking, okay, well, you know, when the, when the Messiah comes, whose family and lineage will he be from? So they say, okay, he'll be a son of King David, because that's what they expect. And Jesus replied, then how could he, the Spirit uh, lead David to call the Messiah his Lord? David said, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for you. If David called the Messiah his Lord, how can the Messiah be the son of David? No one was able to give Jesus an answer. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now, uh, here is the puzzle. So if, uh, you know, in, in that culture and time, uh, the, the, the children had to respect their parents. So it's not, it doesn't work the other way around that the parents respect the children. Like, you know, the, so David, the, the, the four parent wouldn't be calling his uh, great, 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 great grandson, uh, Lord. It's the, it should be the other way around. The grandson should be left, referring to him as Lord David. So how did David looking ahead call this one his Lord? Uh, there's a number of problems here. Uh, so, let me just say off the bat that uh, I'm aware that our Christian friends would say that, well, David could call him Lord because David knew that he would be the Lord God. And they would take this passage to mean that Jesus is God. Uh, but, but this is far from, from the um, ambit of thought at the time. So Jesus was giving a message that could be understood by people. And uh, he wasn't telling them things in such a secret and uh, you know, obscure way. Um, for them to discover later on, oh, you know what, we're fucking back. Remember when Jesus said, spoke about David and he had this saying about who's the, the Lord and whatever, how could the Messiah be the son of David? He meant at that time that he was God. No, there was an immediate meaning in that context, in that situation. Uh, so to me, the, the simple meaning is that uh, Jesus is not from the lineage of David. Uh, but the gospel writers tried to prove that he's from the lineage of David. They somehow got the idea that he's from the lineage of David and uh, he uh, will be the, the king that will overthrow the Roman rule. That idea set in and that is what, uh, you know, uh, in, instigated the Roman government to try and put Jesus to death because they thought that he is committing treason, telling people that he is going to be that uh, son of David who will overthrow Roman rule and establish the kingdom of God on earth. So they didn't uh, accept that. Uh, so um, we, we, we know from the Quran that uh, Mary is addressed as sister of Harun, which means that uh, Mary is from the priestly line. And uh, that means that uh, Jesus would also be from that priestly line. He wouldn't be from the kingly line, which is David's uh, lineage. So, so this saying actually corresponds with Muslim, uh, with, with something in, in Muslim thought. Um, and um, if, if, if Jesus was to be that son of David, a king messiah, then he should have been king. But, but he wasn't king, not in the earthly sense. And uh, when, you know, it was clear that uh, that Jesus was not king, uh, the gospel according to John tried to turn away the meaning uh, to have Jesus say that his kingdom is not of this world. So he's still a king, but he's not, uh, his kingdom is not of this world. But the, the, the context in the synoptic gospels was such that uh, it, it really meant that he would be, you know, the uh, temporal ruler. 
And even in the Gospel according to John, it is clear that everybody was understanding it this way. And this is why it is mentioned even in, in John that uh, the Jewish leaders thought better to hand over Jesus so that the Roman authorities can deal with him rather than they defend Jesus and then they would be accused of harboring a terrorist or, or harboring a, um, a, an insurrectionist. And, uh, and so that's, that, that's the explanation for why Jesus uh, got um, arrested by the uh, Roman authorities and why the Jews were willing to sell him out uh, to the Roman authorities. So all of this shows that Jesus was not really from the Davidic line, but somehow the Gospels got uh, sidetracked into representing Jesus this way. Now, so the Gospels have it that Jesus quoted this psalm, which is the 110th psalm, where uh, the writer says that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for you. So uh, for, from Jesus' point of view, according to this story, David wrote this psalm and David was saying, the Lord said to my Lord. So if David is saying the Lord said to my Lord, so that means David is saying the Lord, which is the Lord God, said to my Lord, which is some other Lord, like which is this other Lord. Now we should point out that there is a distinction made in the Hebrew between the Lord God and this other Lord. This one is a secondary Lord. Um, uh, so, so David did not have in mind, even if he wrote this, that there is a, there, there are two Lord Gods. No, to, for, for the Old Testament, there is only one Lord God, but you can have another person who is addressed as Lord. That's a title of respect, and that is not a problem. So there is Yahweh. Yahweh is said to Marie. Marie is my Lord. So there's a distinction between Yahweh and Marie in the, in the Hebrew. Yahweh is the only God again and again in the Old Testament. Uh, now, uh, what is interesting, though, is that uh, modern studies uh, do not ascribe this to, to David as the author. Uh, the uh, writers uh, think, that the modern commentators uh, think, that this was composed by a court poet uh, or a court prophet uh, who is uh, addressing David as, as my Lord. So uh, the, 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 this court poet is saying the Lord God it is said to my Lord, that is David, to my Lord David, the Lord God Yahweh said to my Lord David, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies onto, into a footstool for you. So this would mean that uh, the Lord God is appointing David here on earth uh, uh, to sit on the throne. And, and, and that would be symbolic that David is at the right hand of God. And... Um, and then David would be the conqueror so that his uh, enemies would be his footstool. You know, you have the imagery here of ancient times where uh, a king to prove his, uh, his power uh, would have his uh, enemies brought uh, so that he rests his feet uh, on them. Um, that's the kind of vivid imagery, whether it happened in fact or not that anyone did this. Uh, that's the idea that the enemies are not there strutting on horses coming to attack uh, the king's uh, soldiers, but uh, the enemies are now laying uh, low beneath his feet and he is, you know, uh, putting his, resting his feet on their slain bodies. Um, not, not, not a pleasant picture for, uh, to envision Jesus in if one wants to think of Jesus as being Prince of Peace. And of course, in the Quran, there is no violence attributed to Jesus anywhere and only peace is associated with him. So you could say, Peace be upon me the day I was born, the day, the day I shall die and the day I shall be raised alive. Um, so all about peace for Jesus, but uh, uh, this, if this passage is taken as a reference to Jesus, then it is obviously uh, representing Jesus as a, a divine conqueror, as a warrior, uh, not necessarily a, a divine, well, I mean, the whole passage seems to present Jesus in a, in a higher than human light, but uh, nonetheless, um, the, uh, th that's the, the, um, the language of the of the passage calling human beings lords calling the king at the time lord and so that people could bow down and worship god and the king uh, as we read in first chronicles chapter uh, 29 verse number 20. Uh, so in, in short in short jesus um, in this passage is uh, 
asking them how could the Messiah be uh, the Lord of David um, if you say that he is from the lineage of, of David and uh, the Muslim answer can be uh, that uh, Jesus wasn't from the lineage of David. He was the Messiah, but not a kingly Messiah. He was a priestly or a prophet uh, Messiah. And that would explain why Mary is called in the Quran, sister of Aaron, uh, to show that Jesus was uh, from a different lineage. He was from the Aaronic uh, lineage, and that's a priestly line. Um, okay, so that's uh, all, all the commentary that is needed on this uh, chapter. I've read the whole chapter. Uh, chapter 22 and now I go to your questions and comments so let me see what uh, questions I can answer for you and um, let me rearrange my desktop a little bit so that I can see all your comments uh, and in terms of those who have shared this stream I only see Mafiru's uh, Ramli uh, doing it so thank you my brother Mafiru's and uh, may Allah SWT bless you and all of the people around you thank you for doing that and uh, others, if you feel that this is beneficial, do share it with others as well. Share it on, share the stream, so that other people may be able to um, uh, join in as well. Okay. Uh, so I want to bring your questions close to my line of sight here, and uh, try to answer them the best that I can. All right, so where are your comments now? Okay, here they are. So Abdul Malik Sulaiman saying Assalamu Alaikum Sheikh and Wa Alaikum Salam, my brother, and uh, Ahmed Abbas saying Assalamu Alaikum Dr. Shabir. Why do Christians claim Jesus is sinless? Jesus, despite him killing 2,000 pigs by making demons dwell in them, which made them uh, suffer, uh, fall off a cliff and eventually die by drowning. Um, Furthermore, uh, people tending the, the, the pigs lost their source of income. How are these actions and not, consider it, not considered sins? If he was God, he could have made the demons perish without harming the pigs. I can't understand the logic behind the alleged sinlessness of uh, Jesus, according to such gospel accounts. What are your thoughts? I think that's an interesting question, um, uh, my brother. Um, you, you know, if, if somebody is going to assert that somebody has never committed a sin, and this person is a human, first of all, it runs contrary to what we know about humans generally. So you human beings, by nature, sin. I mean, we all sin. Uh, so to say that somebody has never committed a sin, how do we know that? Like, how would the gospel writers know that? Uh, of course, it's not the gospel writers who say that uh, Jesus is completely sinless. This is later Christian doctrine. They, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus was like us in every respect, but without sin. So how would the author of Hebrews know that? Who is the author of Hebrews in the first place? Nobody knows. Um, but for somebody to know that Jesus was completely sinless, uh, you know, you would have to have him under surveillance for 24-7 in all circumstances. And uh, that seems to be like, you know, a tall order. Um, so it's, it's a Christian belief uh, that Jesus was sinless in that way. Muslims do not have to have that belief that Jesus was sinless in that way. We, we only need to believe that uh, he and other prophets were sinless to the extent that they wouldn't forge a, a revelation and say that this is from God. I mean, what they said to be a revelation from God was genuine revelation from God. That, that's all that's required of Muslim uh, belief with regards to the, to the prophets. And of course, that God forgives them so that there is nothing remaining. Now, uh, there is uh, mention in Muslim hadith that uh, the prophets of God will be approached on the day of judgment and they will be asked to intercede uh, with God, uh, but everyone will demure, uh, mentioning some uh, mishap in their lives, uh, some sin that they committed. Um, and then uh, when the matter is put to Jesus, he will also demure, but he will not uh, mention any sin. And so we don't have mentioned in Muslim tradition any sin regarding Jesus. 
that Jesus committed any sin. Even if we have a hadith that says that every child when born is touched by Satan except for Jesus and his mother, as a result of which the child cries. Now, whether this is scientific or not, that's a different question. But um, the uh, point here is that even this hadith seems to confirm that Jesus was sinless and, uh, you know, he was a pure boy. Uh, the Quran says that God said, uh, you know, through the angel, uh, that uh, we are going to give you a pure uh, child. Um, so, 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 you know, we hold Jesus in high esteem, but if we take the gospel narratives into view, you're right, uh, that, you know, some problems are presented um, in this, uh, you know, for this idea of the sinlessness of Jesus. Um, may God help us all to understand his message. Okay, Muhammad Ali saying, Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amin, jazakallah khairan. And Muhammad Ali again, jazakallah khairan. And Amin, ya Rab. Okay, so those are all of the comments I see here today. I don't uh, see any questions that I need to answer, uh, apart from the one that was asked uh, about uh, the pigs. Um, so I think we can call it an early um, end to our session today. Well, it's not too early because normally, I expect to be with you folks for an hour and uh, it's close uh, to the hour so it'll be a good point at which to finish and uh, um, I, I thank you all for being here thank you for joining thank you for commenting thank you for sharing the stream and uh, thank you for being actively engaged uh, and I pray that uh, God will protect you all and all of the people around you in your respective countries I recognize that you are from around the world in various countries and uh, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all. Uh, the games are still going on, the FIFA games, and I know that a lot of Muslims are excited after uh, Morocco has been shining, and, um, and for other reasons as well. And like any other people, regardless of who wins, uh, you know, we just are happy to know that other people are happy. I don't follow the games myself, uh, but uh, I'm happy to know that there's something that is, uh, you know, decent. Uh, that is uh, occupying people, otherwise people would be turning to sinful things and you know there's something good there in the world is rallying people, bringing people together and in this case uh, bringing people from outside of the uh, uh, Arab world into a, an Arab and Muslim situation and so that they can experience firsthand uh, hospitality and uh, and the civility of uh, the Muslim people there. Of course, I don't defend anyone against any um, anything that's not right. Uh, you know, if they, if they do wrong, then we should be the first to condemn our f fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. But nonetheless, um, uh, you know, uh, that's my quick comment on, on regarding the games going on. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about the best uh, results for us all in this world and the life hereafter. I thank you all again for being here. Uh, see you again next week inshallah oh and i must let you know that uh, uh, next uh, saturday uh, coming saturday that is uh, there's going to be a debate between myself reverend samuel green in australia and uh, uh, reverend uh, Ru rudolf boshoff and uh, uh, our brother um, um, yusuf ismail from south africa um, the topic will be, is Jesus God with us? So that will be a pre-Christmas uh, special debate. And um, I hope you will all join us for that. So it'll be 11 p.m. here in Toronto on Saturday night. And it'll be Sunday morning, early Sunday morning in South Africa and uh, early Sunday afternoon in uh, Australia. So do join us for that. More details will be posted, inshallah, on uh, my Facebook page eventually. So thank you all for being here. Jazakumullah khairan. Fi amanullah. And see you again next week, inshallah, and during the debate and again in my Facebook page on Sunday morning, uh, Sunday early afternoon as usual. Jazakumullah khairan and peace be with you all.